Today on North 2 we are going to be talking about ghosts and other various forms of paranormal activity. Ghosts have been a relevant paranormal concept in many societies across history. Even in the modern day, I am willing to bet that about a third of the people you know are open to the idea of ghosts being real. This interesting cultural phenomenon remains dominant in books, TV shows, movies, and the classic ghost story. I will be analyzing the reality of their existence, giving cultural context, and using good old science to get to the bottom of this. Our ideas of ghosts, at least for my mainly western viewers, is a very biased Catholic idea. The Catholic view is only a sliver of the many pagan beliefs that were once held. So before we jump into the ghosts of the modern day, let's get some historical context. For to remain ignorant to history is to remain a child. In medieval times, such entities were typically referred to as revenants. They were an accepted phenomenon in the Catholic Church. Their existence was thought of as souls in purgatory that required human intervention to find eternal peace. They also warned the living about the horrors of the wastelands of purgatory bordering hell. These souls returned to haunt the living because they were disrespected in some way. Perhaps their burial rituals were not performed correctly, they had unfinished business, committed suicide, or were not able to confess all their sins before death. At first in the early church, ghosts were more concerned about asking viewers for help in some way. Later they appeared mainly as tourist guides, bringing adventurers to destinations in tales and poems. During the Reformation, the new churches wanted to separate themselves from other churches and pagan beliefs. One of the things they did was turn the concept of revenants into diabolical beings and monsters. Similar to our modern concepts of ghosts and demons. But to get a better understanding of these beings, let's go further back in European culture. Ghosts were not only present in Catholic beliefs. Prior to the widespread expanse of Christianity, Northern Europe was full of many diverse pagan beliefs. Ghosts were common in many of these belief systems. They were understood as a natural aspect of human existence. Sort of similar to the later Catholic ideas, ghosts were spirits of the dead with unfinished business. It was thought that the viewer of such an entity was being called on to help them in their goal of eternal peace. They were not demonized in many pagan beliefs and one may actually have felt lucky to have an encounter with a being from another realm. Cultures of Northern Europe, including the Celts and the Gaels, used to celebrate a widespread festival called Samhain. It was a festival that typically celebrated the beginning of the dark half of the year. During this time, it was believed that the realm between the living and the dead overlapped. Because of this, ghosts could be encountered. They had great feasts, did rituals to honor the supernatural, and respected the dead. In 601 AD, Pope Gregory I directed missionaries to Christianize this celebration. Over time, the celebration would become known as All Saints Day or Hallows Day, and the night before was called Hallows Evening, shortened to Halloween. In the early church, speaking or interacting with the dead was frowned upon and Halloween became the only day in which it was appropriate. This Christianized pagan tradition has stayed with us to the modern day and is one of the largest holidays in at least the United States. In Christian and Catholic beliefs, ghosts have sort of been amalgamated into a more simple concept to understand. They took the aspects of pagan beliefs that were perhaps the most universal and combined them. I am not saying this is good or bad, but there are a lot of other cultures we can look to to find a moral to the story of ghosts. In Greece, the existence of ghosts was thought of as a product of forgetting legacy or improper burial. It was also thought that monuments and statues gave the dead more importance in the afterlife. In a ghost story written by Roman writer Plinus, the Greek philosopher Athendorus visited Athens after hearing the tale of a haunted house. He decided to spend a night at the house. Athenodorus was a stoic man. He did not fear the supernatural. While writing, he kept hearing noises. When he finally looked up, he was greeted with an ominous, translucent figure pointing at him. Instead of becoming frightened, he followed the ghost outside. There the ghost hovered over a certain place and then vanished. 
The next morning, a skeleton was dug up and given a proper burial. The ghost was never seen again. This is a strong example of why ghosts are a tool for keeping people moral. Respecting the dead has been a long-lived human tradition almost unanimously. Stories like these reinforce our traditions. The Romans thought a very similar way. They developed institutions in which citizens could pay to prevent poor burial and remembrance. This is touching on a very existential thought. I am sure all of you have thought about your own legacy. Many of us are scared that one day people will forget we ever existed. It is likely the same fear that rationalized the existence of these entities. I feel this tradition of respecting the dead is very basal to our species. We have likely done similar behaviors for as long as you could consider us human. It is known that chimps as well as elephants actually mourn their dead. Elephants will often visit the site of a dead relative and pass around the remains. This behavior does not seem to have any benefits to their survival, but is rather a side effect of having such a large and powerful brain. But the meanings of ghosts do not stop there. In Norse belief systems, ghosts were very physical beings. There were two types of ghosts, the Hogby and the Draugr. The Hogby were quite passive and only dangerous if its grave was disturbed. The Draugr, on the other hand, was a malvoyant spirit who could destroy buildings and kill all who could see. They were not merely translucent silhouettes, but the possessed body of the dead, sort of like a zombie. Norse stories include interesting accounts of these entities. In the Erebagia saga, a Christian woman named Thorgunna fell ill. Her dying wish was to be buried in a Christian churchyard. The party of Norse had to undergo a two-day journey to fulfill her wish. They begged for hospitality from a local farmer, but their pleas were not answered. Forced to sleep in the harsh weather, they awoke to a truly baffling sight. Thorgunna was completely naked and reanimated, cooking supper for the party. Though she was a draugr, she was not violent. The farmer at such a sight immediately realized his wrongdoing. He changed his mind and let the party in to enjoy the draugr food. Thorgunna then crept back to her eternal slumber in peace. The farmer later suffered from disease and other paranormal attacks. This story offers another interesting perspective about these paranormal entities. The farmer had treated the party like a dog, left out in the rain with no food. Because of this, he was cursed with an upset spirit. Did this story actually happen? No, it most certainly did not, but the message stands clear. Treat the dead with honor and the living with hospitality. The concept of ghosts seems to be a powerful cultural idea that makes sure everyone is laid to rest with respect and remembrance. But in this example, we see something more. Treating the living wrongfully can have supernatural consequences. In Islam, jinn are similar to Western ghosts, but much more complicated. According to the Quran, God created jinn as well as angels and humans. Just like Christianity, jinn existed in the pre-Islamic era as a pagan belief. Similar to Western revenants, jinn are neither innately evil nor innately good. Jinn are not the souls of dead men, but rather they are their own supernatural creatures. They are able to move into various shapes and are often undetectable. They were feared for their ability to attack while remaining invisible. Jinn were supernatural creatures, but they were also quite moral. They could be slain and they also had to eat, sleep, and drink. Jinn were also thought to have caused infections and dysfunctional behaviors, often being the blame for misfortune. One of the Jinn's roles was to tell humans about the truths of the heavens. They were able to eavesdrop on angels. It was thought that the jinn told fortune tellers and sorcerers their secrets. In Islamic belief, this all changed when Prophet Muhammad began receiving revelations. After this point, the jinn could no longer access the heavens because centuries prevented them. Their power after this point was lost. A survey was done about Muslim beliefs and it was found that in 13 out of 23 countries, more than half of the Muslims believe in these beings. 
In Bangladesh, 12% of people have reported sightings of jinn. Islam has acknowledged the similarities between jinn and western ghosts, and the concept of jinn may be the product of several pagan beliefs integrated into Islam. The Quran is interpreted as metaphorical in some cases, and jinn are often interpreted as merely people rather than supernatural beings. So what are we to make of these beings? The diversity in their qualities and motives makes it hard to come to a simple conclusion. Perhaps they are a bit of an existential scapegoat. When something bad would happen, it would be easy to blame the jinn. Humans are great at seeing patterns in their life when they might not exist. So when something comes out of the blue like a disease or injury, humans look for something to blame. The uncomfortable truth is that the universe is random and we don't have that much control. This lack of control is responsible for the belief that some supernatural benevolent entity is causing our misfortune. Many pagan beliefs were characterized by the belief in many strange demons and deities. These entities could help them settle the chaos in their lives. Since we know many pagan beliefs eventually would make up our major religions, we can look at them as an early stage in the evolution of religion. Another fascinating tale of a ghost or paranormal being is in the Native American Wendigo. Natives in the Algonquian language family all believe in this spirit. It is not really a ghost, but its cultural significance is similar to other ghost beliefs. The Wendigo is depicted as a large human figure who is skinny and extremely fast. It is known for its insatiable hunger for human flesh. It will often prey on people separated from the tribe. This spirit actually has many symbolic meanings associated with it. It resembles winter, hunger, and the problem with selfishness. In native belief systems, if you consume human flesh or be selfish, you are actually at risk of transforming into this creature. It promotes tribe members to share their resources and stay with the community. The winters of the northeast are brutal. Not only do you not want to become a Wendigo yourself, but you also don't want your kin to turn. This fear was a powerful motivator to keep the tribe in line. We have examined a diverse array of cultural stories of ghosts and demons. The overall theme of these stories is that the supernatural, at least in the sense of ghosts, is a powerful cultural tool to keep people behaving in moral ways. In the Native American case, the Wendigo taught the tribe to not be selfish. In Islam, we saw that the jinn could sometimes represent a way of finding meaning in a chaotic world. The Greeks and Romans put an emphasis on honoring and remembering their dead. In the European pagan, Norse, and Catholic beliefs, we see that ghosts mainly taught the living to respect the dead and live your life virtuously. Overall, ghosts and various other examples of paranormal activity have a meaning in all of these cultures. Their presence or existence warn the living in many cases. Now let's dive into the fascinating topic of the continued belief in these entities. Soon after the conclusion of the Second World War, Winston Churchill took a lavish vacation to the White House. He was enjoying a long bath with a scotch and a cigar. With his time spent, he got up to go dry off. Waiting for him in the adjoining room was the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. Churchill then announced, Good evening, Mr. President. You seem to have me at a disadvantage. The spirit then smiled and vanished. Churchill was not known to make such wild things up. So why would such a sharp and respected man make up such a story? Well, even as skeptical as I am, I believe he truly did see the long dead president. The real question is, was there a truly any physical embodiment of the president there that night, or did Churchill's brain create the image for him? The human brain is far from a perfect organ. It is notoriously good at seeing things that aren't there, and even changing memories to believe something else happened. Many paranormal experiences are actually quite explainable in the brain. Reports of poltergeists invisibly moving objects seem to be consistent with damage to certain regions of the brain that are responsible for visual processing. Certain forms of epilepsy can also create a very spooky feeling that a presence is stalking you nearby. Out-of-body experiences are also now an accepted neurological phenomenon. Visual illusions are also something more common than we care to accept. 
an Italian psychologist reported seeing an old grizzled man staring back at him in the mirror. To further inspection, he realized that the poor light of the late hours actually just made an illusion. In low light or poor conditions, the brain is actually very good at seeing things that are not there. Pareidolia is a tendency for the brain to see meaningful patterns when they may not be. A common example is the famous face on Mars. The picture is now known to be just a product of strange lighting and false human perception. Since we know it is a lot easier to see illusions in low light hours, it is not a coincidence that ghost sightings are almost exclusive to the dark. For this reason, I truly believe Churchill saw the president there on that late night, but perhaps the president only existed in his mind. It has been found that drugs and alcohol can play an important role in seeing things that aren't there. Sleep is also very important. Whether you are very tired or just woke up, your brain may still be in a state of dreaming. It is common for many to randomly wake up in the middle of the night. In these moments, your brain may be half awake and you're much more prone to seeing things. Funny enough, as skeptical a person I am, I have truly seen a ghost. I was probably only around 10 years old at the time. I woke up in the middle of the night at a sleepover with my friend. At the foot of the bed, I saw a figure which seemed to be made out of smoke walk along my room until it slowly faded away. I immediately woke up my friend so he could see the ghost too. A fool was I. What this experience taught me is that seeing ghosts is a very real thing. What is not real is their existence in any physical or measurable way. They are a product of our imperfect brains. It shouldn't come as a surprise that our brains are able to see things when they are not there. Powerful psychedelic drugs can make this happen on command and thirst and starvation can do the same. What we as humans have to admit is that we are not perfect observers of reality. Our minds are imperfect systems that can believe anything they want. What I find interesting is how people can actually see people they know in these illusions. In my sighting, it was just a blank silhouette, but in Churchill's case, he saw the long dead precedent. It should come as no surprise that the brain could reconstruct something that it has seen before. I think it is fascinating how all the cultures I mentioned interpreted such sightings. Three quarters of Americans believe in ghosts, and nearly one in five claim to actually have seen one. I guess I am one of those one in five. The continued belief in these entities is a worldwide phenomenon. For example, in Taiwan, about 90% of people report seeing ghosts. They also have a whole month-long festival about ghosts. After I have dumped all of this information on you, what do you think? Are ghosts real? Personally, I do not believe in ghosts in any meaningful way. I believe people see them. Hell, I saw one. But I do not think they exist in any other realm. But who knows, maybe I am wrong. If these ghosts are just illusions similar to the ones you see on powerful psychedelic drugs, then perhaps they are a product of our minds. Some people seem to think that things you see in psychedelics like DMT are actually a trip to another dimension. They say they meet entities during these experiences that seem very real. I think we all know what bald-headed UFC commentator I am talking about. It is an interesting concept, but it is hard to analyze it in a scientific manner. As our society becomes increasingly intelligent, I think it is time we learn that these sightings are little more than a malfunction of the brain. We no longer live in a time of superstition. Well, at least I hope. Girls seem to carry around a lot of crystals and believe in zodiacs, but other than that, I think superstition is kind of going away. We are able to actually get to the bottom of these cases through scientific means. This is why I advocate so much for science and a skeptical view of the world. Everything can be explained through naturalistic explanations. I will end this video with the wise words of the great and powerful Joe Rogan. I know, right? Were you scared of a few ghosts? What have ghosts ever done? Yeah. They never killed anybody. They never oh, killed people. To Fred. Oh, a fucking ghost killed him. <laughs> it's just like no one's ever died from a ghost. I hope you enjoyed this video. I have wanted to tackle this subject for some time and I am glad I could do it in a way where I didn't totally dismiss the existence of these sightings. The sightings are real, the ghosts are most likely not. I want to say thanks to my friend Armal who helped me with my section on the Jin. Thanks for watching and make sure you like and subscribe. I make a variety of videos on ancient animals, human evolution, and even full length history documentaries. If that sounds interesting, then go check out the over 100 episodes I have made. Well, I'll see you on the next episode of Northo 2.
See ya.